I, I want to thank you for letting us into your dressing room. Not many people get to come back here. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm afraid to know what, if these walls could speak. You know, I don't want to know. You no, know, this is another era. No, everything is. There's just a lot of music goes up on in, in here. I, I like what you've done with the place. You got a piano in the dressing piano, room. Yeah. Not just any piano. This is a serious piano. Steinway, yeah. You spend uh, good time here. It be, it belies my my actual level of ability to play, because uh, but yeah we, I spend but a lot of a lot of the uh, cats in the band come, when I'm the nights I'm not here people come practice, and work on stuff and uh, so a, a lot of us use the room and it's my room but we, we we all. Use it. And then there's work being done right there. What are we looking at? Right. No, that, well, that was supposed to be an arrangement of. Uh, I'm so lonesome I could cry, but we ended up not not using that arrangement. But you'll put in real time right here, creating, composing, yeah, conceptualizing. I, mean, doing, I do that all the time. So I'm, I'm no always, matter where you are. Yeah, most of the times I'm in an automobile because I'm afraid to fly. So I, um, <laughs> I, got, I, I, I logged in a good 16 hour drive last night. You just got here from Chicago. I just got here yesterday. A lot of people don't realize this fear of flying thing. I mean, Renaissance man, right? <laughs> Pulitzer Prize winner, afraid to fly. What, what are you afraid of in flying? What everybody in the world is afraid of. <laughs> I said we all, all the people who have fear, a phobia of flying all have the same fear. You may have it. I do, <laughs> but I do it anyway. You know, I do it anyway too. I mean, if I, I'm, I have to go to Korea at the end of this week, so I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna drive. So what do you do? What I do you just get on it and act like I'm cool. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, you wouldn't know if you sat next to me, I fake it. But inside it's churning. Yeah, yeah, you know, but I mean, I, I I do a good job. Now you came here from Chicago in a car, in a bus, in a what? car, yeah, car. Who's driving the car? Frank Stewart. Frank, the great photographer. Great Frank Stewart. He's a good man. Frank and, and Big Boss Murphy is our road manager. And what and do you do during the ride? What what? Well, I edited some scores, and I I took, I took notes because I'm gonna be in the studio after we finish this, and I if, when I get my phone, I can show you what some notes look like, like a. I, I look at the score and then I, I give mixed notes, like what, what we're going to do. As a matter of fact, you reach me the phone, I'll show it sure, to you. Not sure. that anybody on radio can tell what we're doing. Where is it? It's, it's over there somewhere, right? Do you see it? I don't think I you see it. You see my phone anywhere, Zoe? So this is, a, this is a record we have coming out. And this was done on the, on the car ride? In the, in the car part of it. I mean, it's too much work to do in, in one ride. But it's uh, each song probably takes like an hour and a half to two hours to, to, to listen to and go through what the notes should be. Um, and you so, can lock in and block everybody out, whatever yeah, well, else this, is going but on. This is, this is not composed, this is just notes. So this, mm -hmm. this is instructions of how we're going to work with the recording we have. Wow. What we're gonna do, with, where we should raise instruments, how we balanced it. At B, tom-toms are echoey and in the bass's way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a criticism. We got to fix that. So this is from right. just listening to it on the on the earphone. From listening listening to it after we put the recordings together, right. but our, our our engineer Ty Whitelock, engineer producer, we've been working with each other for a very long time. So a lot of times in the notes, I I'll say some wild stuff, <laughs> but it's just us dealing with it. Can we eliminate the stomps? Right. Right. Less bass or more piano on the bass died from beginning. This is, I mean, this is how it works, right? Yeah. This is how you do yeah. it. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's just a... Uh, but that's yeah, nonstop, correct? Yeah, for me, it's, not, it's nonstop. It's a blessing. Uh, you know, I write the music. I work on it. I, uh, I, I, we all do that. I mean, I, I, I work on it, but we have 10 arrangers in our band, and everybody works on music. This particular recording that we're working on now is called a Jazz in Art, mm -hmm. and it has... Um, Pieces from different different composers. Bill Frizzell is one of them. Um, Doug Womble is another. Vincent Gardner from our orchestra, a fantastic trombone playing singer, is, is one also artistic director of Jazz Houston. Chris Crenshaw is another composer. Papo Vasquez, phenomenal ge genius of Afro-Latin music, wrote a great piece in six. He writes out all the batad drum, all the parts he writes out. He's, he's unbelievable. And... Um, who else wrote wrote pieces? We we it's, it's seven pieces on this on this recording, extended pieces inspired by different artists. Winslow Homer is one, and 
uh, The Repose in All Things, Tim Armacost, very interesting composition he did based on Mondrian's paintings. What I find yeah. incredible is that this is nonstop. And you say that you don't even feel like you're at full capacity. That's what you tell me. No, no, yeah. From yeah, time I'm, to time. I don't understand that. This, this is, I'm, I'm just, uh, well, I, I kind of paced myself the whole time to get to this age. And up in this age, I figured I would, uh, I would start to really be, really start to, to be productive and get all the things that we've been doing all these years out and be very active about uh, participating in our culture and be, be even more serious. Yeah, be <laughs> even, even more serious. Like I'm, I'm so deathly serious at this point and, uh, and grateful, you know, though, I mean, just to, 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 to get to that kind of humility and work ethic out of gratitude for having had the opportunity to, to be out here all these years and interface with people and their kids and work on music and play and work with so many fantastic musicians and people and then that, to be able to develop an organization like we have and to play Duke Ellington's great music and to realize the dreams of a lot of musicians and the artists that came before me that I studied with and uh, were mentored by and to, to be able to have the energy and the creativity to last this long and do it. Does it feel like you're running out of time? Is there some urgency I, I'm here? Always, I always feel like I'm running out of time. I, you know, I felt like I was running out of time when I was 20. So I always feel like that. But... Uh, there are not enough hours in a day. No, not not for an individual person, but this work goes right. on. It was going on before you were born. It's going to go on long after you've passed away. Right. So I'm also cognizant of that. You know, and, and the one, whatever you do f fits into the canon of all the other things that have been done, whatever you develop. Right. And there'll be other people who will develop, and they're doing it while you're doing it. Right. So it's not like the world needs your contribution. It's just you are a part of that of that continuum. I would disagree with that. The world needs your contribution. <laughs> yeah, the world's done pretty so. well with it. <laughs> they would do good without it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Humble man. Um, let, let's talk about this movie. Buddy Bolden, the first king of jazz. That's mm -hmm. pretty accurate, right? Or at yeah. least one of them. No, he's the first one. We meet him in a flashback. He's in a mental institution. He hears Louis Armstrong on the radio. It helps him start reflecting on his life. And then we get into this movie. Mm -hmm. I never really considered Buddy Bolden. There was a point in your life when you'd never heard of him either. What was your first sort of contact with his name and his work? Well, some of the older musicians in New Orleans would talk about him. And the legend of him at that time was that he worked in a barber shop. He edited a newspaper called The Cricket. And the, the women loved him. He was handsome and he could play. So I knew that part of his story. Since childhood? Yeah, probably since nine, eight, nine, ten. I played in Danny Barker's Fairview Baptist Church Band for a little while, and Danny knew all the old folklore, and he was trying to teach younger musicians at that time how to play New Orleans music. And we weren't that interested in playing it. At least I wasn't. I can't speak for everybody. There's, that was in the post-civil rights era, early 70s. And we, you know, talk about our Afros and Malcolm X and, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, you go from that to talk about won't you come home, Bill, ba Bill Bailey. That was a stretch. Right, James Brown too. He, James Brown, you know, JB, was he was still on the scene, but he was kind of in that throat period that was going into Parliament. It was going into where JB had a couple of hits, but it wasn't like he was in the 60s, you know. Right. And uh, that's when Stevie was ascending. And, right. and that's around the time of what's going on. Right. And, and uh, you know, for somebody my age, that early 70s, the big difference between the early and kind of to mid seventies and the late seventies. Huge the, difference. Disco the, yeah, at the end, right? Huge difference. Yeah, you could yeah. just see stuff. I was playing in a funk band almost that whole time, so we we could we had a, a pulse kind of on the direction of the music. But the New Orleans music, I, I was blessed because my father made us go do it, and we didn't want to do it, my brother and I. Right. But uh, the songs I learned play, with the Fairview Baptist Church band, I still can remember. Stuff like Over in the Glory Land, Little Liza Jane, Joy Every Second Line, uh, um, but Lay Down My Burden, Lay Down My Burden Down by the Riverside. Okay. Those songs I still I can still still remember them and play them. Didn't he ramble? You know, it's all the kind of New Orleans classic songs of St. James Infirmary that were not something that somebody that was eight or nine years old, 10, 
was interested in, in knowing at that time. And so then you, you learn of this, this Bolden guy and the legend is out there. <laughs> right. And then the more you learn about him, you had to be in awe. Well, I heard uh, uh, there was a book written by a guy named Donald Marquis. And Don, he's still alive. And this book was called In Search of Buddy Bolden. And it was factual, unbelievably well-researched, interviews with people who were around when he was around. And it dispels a lot of the myth of Buddy Bolden in terms of him working at a, in a newspaper and, uh, and, and be, being a barber and all of that. Not true. No, but okay. the, but the, the depth of his playing was true. What people said about him, uh, first-hand accounts of just, they say he could, he's the first one who played the blues, married the blues with the church music. So, well, there's know, a great line in the movie where he says, I make the church music better. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's what improvisation is. The root of it is improve. So you, you, he, but that's, that's blasphemy, though. Right, I mean, well, in, a, in a certain in a certain sense, not it's n- not not necessarily like it depends on who whether it's blasphemy depends on who you are, you know, and it's like a, a lot of times musicians would be castigated for doing hymns, but when Louis Armstrong recorded "When the Saints Go Marching In," nobody messed with him. <laughs> Whereas on the other hand, Sister Rosetta Thorpe right. got got uh, excommunicated. I don't know how many times three or four times, you know. I, I mean, at this point, what, what do you have to do to get excommunicated? Right. <laughs> I don't think you can find anything you can do to do that at this point. Right. He, um, th- there's a scene in the movie where he jumps out of a hot air balloon. <laughs> I mean, that's a stretch. Th- Dan Pritzker is the, 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 uh, the, the brains behind the movie. This is out of his imagination, or did that ever happen? No, man, Bolden didn't do that. Nobody did any <laughs> such thing. Trumpet players would. Somebody might have done it. He didn't do it. But he jumps out. He's got a horn in his hand, a cornet in his hand, and he starts playing as he's halfway down. But there's, you know a, the, there's a band on the ground that's playing traditional music yeah. out of the, out of the <clears throat> off off the off the notes and everything else, and but, and he he blows them out of the water. But the movie is not is not a. Uh, is is not is not a biopic. It's not literal. No, the movie is it's the myth of Buddy Bolden, right. and it's it's a version of what Buddy Bolden's life could have been, or what he meant. And a lot of it is symbolic. Right. Uh, could he have had a manager like Bartley? Yeah, Do, if people had managers like that who would have them doing any kind of thing just to get out there, definitely. Anybody who worked in a record company knows that there's no no level of humiliation that won't be suggested you do, if it's deemed popular. Uh, down to your name, it doesn't matter. Anything stupid you can figure out to do that you think an audience would like some stupidity, there's going to be somebody who will say, man, I got a great idea. It was going to make some money. This is going to make some money. Go do this stupidity. As a guy would say, that's what a manager do. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there's no recorded music by Buddy Bolden, yet you had to have a process to, to come up with it to, to make this soundtrack. Well, I'm from New Orleans first, so I grew up with New Orleans music. Michael, Dr. Michael White, who's on the record, also played in Danny Barker's band, but he played a long time with Danny. He, he's people from Bolden's family are in his family. The neighborhoods Bolden played in, he's grown up playing with, and he's a scholar of our music. And um, I also made some assumptions. I also studied American cornet playing and the styles of the trump, trumpet players, the cornet players who came after Bolden and in Bolden's wake. So. If you take the three trumpet players that came in Bolden's wake, you can you can composite his style. Certain assumptions are made. It's always interesting to me that the assumption would be made that he played less than the people who followed him. Charlie Parker didn't play less than the alto saxophones that followed him. Johann Bach didn't play less keyboard and organ than the organist that followed him. Uh, Paganini, the violinist that followed him, did not play more than he played. So my assumption is that Buddy Bolden could play better than three great trumpet players who, whose foundation are in his playing, acknowledged. Joe Oliver, the King Oliver that was Louis Armstrong's mentor, sent for Armstrong in Chicago. Joe Oliver played with a lot of dignity and he played a very syncopated style. Like he would play phrases like, He 
like the kind of style where he would play those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Freddie Keppel, who played more of a ragtime style. Ragtime would be more like. Bunk Johnson, who played in a in a more smoky style, like So if you take those three styles mm -hmm. and you put those styles together and make Bolden more virtuosic and louder, give him some more aggressive type of growls, it becomes. So Man. you you make him be more like a more like more more aggressive and more physical, and and, and fulfill more of the objectives of those three trumpet players. You kind of meld them together. You meld them or, together. Or you see them coming out of his. They come out of him in my yeah, mind. Yeah. But also let's 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 remember that we have recordings of King Oliver playing, right. and no one can play like them. Right. So the whole thing of well, if we if we had a recording if we had a recording we would just know what we can't sound like. And we have recordings of John Coltrane. People, people don't play like him. Can't do it. We have recordings of Charlie Parker. Nobody. We have recordings of Monk. We have recordings of Miles Davis. Who can play like him? When you program pieces that are like Miles Davis, Gil Evans, and you have the Gil Evans setting, whoever is playing that trumpet is very aware of how much they don't sound like Miles Davis. <laughs> When you went about this, was it about responsibility? Was it awesome? Was it natural? Was it all the above? Yeah, it's natural. It's just fun. You just for, felt for it. For me, it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah. I mean, I've been studying the styles and the musicians for years. Mm -hmm. That's not something that I, uh, that I just picked up because it's a, it's a job. Nothing for me really is a job. It's a calling. I, I'm dedicated to it. I love it. I'm going to practice it and work on it hard. You, you're not going to pay me to make me work more. I'm dedicated to that. I was dedicated to it when I was 12 or 13, once I got serious about it. Right. And um, I'm not really, I, I mean, I, I, I love I loved, I mean, I'm, I'm honored to, to be a, a part of it. My father's a musician. I grew up around the musicians. Mm -hmm. And I always want to illuminate the type of intelligence and the dignity, the humor, and the things that they actually had so that the kind of stereotype version of who they were as people there's always some type of counter statement coming from me. Sure, there's a lot of humanity and a lot of soul in the music. That that's what I got from it. Is that right. is that yeah. fair? Yeah, and and soul is a high is a high level of spiritual attainment. Yeah. People tend to think that soul means you got a toilet voice. Oh, no, we don't have nothing to do with soul. No, that's heart. Soul, is what we're talking soul about. Soul is about is about that feeling. You feel better when 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 we leave. If I see you. Right. And I always noticed with the jazz musicians when I was growing up, when you see them, they hug you, they had a certain warmth. And they were also the most integrated people. I grew up in segregation and of course ignorance in, in that time. But the jazz musicians and the jazz scene was always different, even in New Orleans, which was very much Southern, kind of ignorant backwards mm -hmm. uh, from, a, from a social and a civic standpoint. And how about how that played into, into Bolden's upbringing? Because it was rough. It yeah, was it's tough. Always, it's always rough. You know, it's always rough. It's rough now. It's rough. There's a lot of menstruation going on right now, and it's rough. Yeah. So it's a. Uh, you, you know, he was conscious. The musician, King Oliver, wants a quote of his that I that I love. Is this? He said, "Like, like left wing politics, like left wing politics in the common man, jazz was a cause." <laughs> So there's always this thought that the people then didn't think. But I mean, my, my great uncle was born in 1883 and I lived with him when I was six. He was a stone cutter for the cemetery because in New Orleans, everybody's buried above ground. Right. And I'm gonna tell you, he, he could articulate very clearly 
stuff about the United States, about the Constitution, about Reconstruction, very clearly. And it wasn't like in some type of homespun, we be on the plantation language. When you say jazz is a cause, what do you mean? It's a cause. It, it's, it's tied into democratic consciousness. Like in order for, a, for democracy to work, people who have a lot have to be willing to want a lot for other people who are not like them. And that's difficult. That's asking a lot. Because human beings are clannish. Yeah, but that's what makes the, sim- the symbolism what it is. It, George right. Washington was a man who was offered a kingship, and he turned down a king to be a president. Right. There's a big difference between a king and a president. Right. <laughs> so I say, yeah, well, you know, he's still, yeah, maybe so, but <laughs> being a president is not being a king, man. Right. And uh, that same type of... of, of uh, what that what what that is a symbol of is something that can be passed down to whatever level you happen to be on. And over time, it, many different interpretations. Of course, he lived in his time. He did the things that he did. I don't I don't like to get bogged down into well whether he owned, he owned slaves and he did this and he did that. I'm talking about he was offered a kingship and he turned it down to be president. So um, we all have things that we we can turn down and do other things every day. And, and sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Right. But for our way of life to maintain its vitality and for us to remain a nimble country, we have to figure out how we're going to integrate ourselves with, with more, uh, how we're going to integrate ourselves more as a symbol of pride than something that has to be th- forced down people's throat because they really want to be part of some tribe. You do it you go about this musically right now you're working on what you call a musical manifesto on american ideals you like that i wish i came up with that myself that's pretty good right who came up with that That, that's that's all right (laughs) this uh swing symphony with you all here at jazz at lincoln center working with the st louis symphony orchestra that that's a calling that's a big mission yeah well you know if you if you take for me, I just can look into my, my, my personal experiences. I had the opportunity to play with the New Orleans Philharmonic when I was 14. Uh, they rehearsed in Holly Grove, which was right next to Pigeon Town, where I'm from. And I can still remember the feeling of like adults when they played their first E-flat major chord poem. And I had the opportunity to play with symphonic orchestras all over the world. It was just a, a blessing, and, and, and a, a large part of it is luck. I practiced pieces but it didn't mean I would have that opportunity so later I had the chance to write uh, pieces for symphonic orchestra that piece was actually commissioned by the Berlin Philharmonic and Simon Rattle we had met years ago in the, in the, in the 80s we we're both much younger and he said man well, you should write a piece and we just talked we just had a friendship kind of we knew each other then in 2010 he was getting ready to leave the Berlin Philharmonic he was he was I don't know if he was leaving in 2010, but something was happening with his, with his career at that time. And he said, this is the time to write this piece. So I said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll work on this piece. And I'd written a piece before that, another symphony. It didn't sound that good. So I told him, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to try to get out of this one. He said, no, no, you got to do this one. Like this, this is the time to do it. So I did that one. And um, the Swing Symphony is just takes you through a lot of different strains in American music where jazz and symphonic music have worked together. We have, we have a lot of common ground across different genres and different, and then it expands on those things as if we had continued that line of reasoning or if we had continued that line of integration. It would be as if Brown versus the Board of Education actually created integration in public schools. What would we be like? Or if if Reconstruction had not been dismantled, if we had not backed away from all of the, 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 the great society programs in the 1980s, if we had not backed away from that vision of the 60s, where would we be right now? So I tend to think about that in music and use those things that already exist and expand and expound upon those things. And the Swing Symphony, when I was writing it, I took a diagram of a symphonic orchestra and I put it up on the piano and I would, when I was orchestrating, I would look at 
who had played and who had not played. Who did I want to integrate? Which groups would play with which? And I also had a spatial layout. So right now I'm going to put the st- saxophone section going to converse with the French horns. Or I'm going to have the bass play and the bassoon is going to play now with the bass clarinets in our band. And our trumpets are going to play with straight music and the woodwinds are going to play. Well, now I'm going to have the percussion play this groove that Elvin played and I'm going to give our drums a tambourine part. So all through the Swing Symphony is all kinds of integration of families of uh of instruments in, and you, a, in an unusual way. And you say conversation, I love that. They're talking yeah, to each they other. They always are talking to each other. That's and, our music, we talking with each other yeah. all the time. And, and what are they saying in this symphony? They're saying, let's play these parts right. <laughs> 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 now nah, they say it a, lot, a lot of different things because I, I go through the decades uh, with solutions. These are solutions we had in ragtime. We had this type of solution to syncopation. Now, I'm super syncopating it, so it's not really like ragtime. So it's ragtime, I put a 716 bar in there, a 3-8. I put the Jelly Roll bass line against the type of New Orleans march we played. Or then I have a slow drag in there, so we'll do like uh, Careless Love or Blues. And then I'll use a symphonic line, like with the, with the, with the violins and the flutes playing a high counter line like in a march, and our saxophones playing a riff. And then we'll start playing in the orchestra brass or play like a, a, a funereal march. But you won't know who's playing. Right. So my goal was for you not to know when we play and when the orchestra plays. Can you translate that into words and concept? Yeah, it'd be it, like if our government worked. <laughs> they like would all work together. Yeah, if we actually embraced democracy and greed and, and tribalism didn't make us destroy it. These are tribes working together. In unison. Yeah, we work together. You write it into the score. Also, yeah. we want to work together. It's in, if you take the difference in the generations, like now, kind of the, the near the oldest members of, of the symphonic orchestra would be my generation. We went to camps together. So some of the players I know from when we were 15 or 16, and the younger musicians grew up listening to our records, and there's a great deal of collegiality that when I first started playing, it was not necessarily that way. That's a good thing. So at a time when there's all this despair and alienation, culture wars and division, do you see this as something that can can bring folks to the table at least? We already came to the table and played it. You bring bring people from the outside to the table. You know, it it depends on whether people want to embrace that vision or not. A lot of times you get used to embracing a kind of nihilistic negative vision and you're comfortable with that. And it becomes difficult for you to make those transitions. For example, I mean, you know, like just negative nicknames of people who come in public and call themselves a negative name. It's like kind of kids you you grow up with. If there's an overweight kid or somebody, people tease. They start to tease themselves. Right. If they hold on, man, don't let these don't let these people. You're not here to entertain them. You know, I had a friend like that when I was growing up. They say, don't don't do that, man. Don't. Don't, don't don't do that to keep them from picking on you. Yeah, you become that negative you know, thing. Don't don't do that. Make make them deal with you. Don't don't worry about. It. We'll we'll take we'll pick up your slack. Cause this is a very smart guy with a lot of ability. But people constantly picking on him, hitting him, <laughs> mess with him, take his money from him, right. beat on beat beat him up. Right. I mean, you know, just the kind of stupid stuff that goes on. If you have to speak for real about your experiences, the level of stupidity and ignorance of it. You take a sensitive guy, you know, he ain't, he ain't gonna really fight nobody and he's in a in an ignorant environment. And it's just uh You become that. You become what you're Yeah, you you become that thing because right. you I mean, what are you gonna do? You're not gonna fight, so you try to figure out how to get along. So right. you try to co opt it. Right. And a kind of co opted negativity. If you're on that side of it. And if you're on the aggressive side of it, you start to be convinced that that's a victory for you. You start to, because you see the two things work together. You start to think that choking people out or beating them into the ground or you stomping on them is something that, to be proud of, that it means you won something. When you really, it lowers your humanity to do that too. All right, what, what are you referring to in the larger culture? I'm just referring to all the stuff that we see. I don't, I don't even have to name it. We're seeing it. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about black folks, white folks, Hispanic people. It doesn't matter what name you call it, women. Right. It doesn't matter. You take your pick. Right. Human nature. Human nature. You know, so, everybody's getting their everybody's getting their share of it. So you taking are you taking an optimistic tone in this symphony or a hopeful one or what what kind of tone? I'm mainly optimistic. 
you know, so most of my music is always, always optimistic. And, and we did sit down and we played it. And, and the orchestra was trying to play it. And even more heartening, after we finished recording it and playing it, the con our conductor, Dave Robinson, was very positive. I played in St. Louis Power Hall many times since the 1980s. I played with St. Louis Symphony, actually, at Concerti Fosh, and this is in the 80s. That's one of a community that I love. Uh, David and Thelma Stewart were our sponsors for that concert, also two people that I love. They, they showed up at my mother's funeral. Mm -hmm. So everything is very personal. Uh, the orchestra gave 150% to playing it. Our orchestra, of course, wanted to play it. Then when we mixed the records, which was just last month, the St. Louis Symphony sat down the first time and sent us a lot of detailed mix notes, like the notes I, I, you show, I show. Show down here. If you saw a symphonic <laughs> orchestra sit down and listen to those tapes and say, do you have something here, do you have that? And their notes were so good and detailed and accurate that we went back in and you know we worked ar around the clock for, for two or three days to get it in a certain shape. And they met again and listened to it. And, and and came back with some other very good erudite comments. So to say that it's very much a group and a community enterprise, there's a lot of people had to work to make it come together. Mm -hmm. And and it did come together. It's documented on, on the CD. And it's a, it's a large undertaking, and the parts are hard to play. It's not easy. So you never heard a string orchestra try to play like real bebop lines, like Bird or something. But they're doing it on that. Right. And it's out July 1st, right? I, don't know. I believe yeah, July so. July 1st, yes. Yeah, looking forward to it. So Father's Day is coming up. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? Does it take on special meaning in any you way? You know, yeah, yeah. I love my daddy. You know, always, I always talk about him. A lot of times, people are at odds with their, their parents or their father, but I mean, I have such a deep love and respect for my father. And uh, do you find that the older you get, the smarter he gets? No, he was always smart to me. Well, you, do you realize more <laughs> yeah. now? I, I realize more, but I always looked up to him. You know, I never uh -huh. had a thing where. But he was cool, he's a jazz musician, you know, he was never judgmental of people. Right. He was easy to he was easy he was easy to to embrace. Do you hear yourself saying the same things to your kids? N you know, yeah, in a way, but I mean I, I was always saying his his stuff. Yeah, I taught a lot of classes. The first time I started teaching classes, I was doing some radio shows, T V shows. He said, Man, I hear you I hear you stealing all my stuff. <laughs> I said, Man, I'm I'm stealing good material. <laughs> And you know, yeah, I think, and my father, and also all the fathers, you know, a lot of times from being out there playing gigs and seeing people with their kids, fathers and mothers, but since we're talking about Father's Day, to see people at the end of a night with their son or their daughter, 11 o'clock, 10.30, 11.30, with a, with a group of kids, they want me to hear them play, or they, you know, they've waited around, and I mean, I've been seeing that since 1981. And I always tell the kids, that's your father, is that your, and they say, yeah, I say, remember, it's 11.30, you know, your father's, you got you to go to work tomorrow, 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> so your father's here with you. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's always that feeling I have of, of a community that I love. I mean, I was just in a, in a high school uh, in Ohio when I, when I was at Kenyon College just last, just two, two, two three days ago teaching right. two, two young travel players. It was packed with, with parents and kids, yeah. like a community revival or something. So, you know, I mean, I... I, I always loved loved that feeling. That's a feeling we have that uh, that we need we need to magnify that feeling. There's a there's a line in uh, your letters book to a young jazz musician where you say, "Why play jazz?" This is as your teenager now. You, you didn't feel meaning. Girls didn't like it. All right, no one made money from it. When I was a kid, we equated the past with degradation and the useless. You didn't necessarily get what your dad was playing. Right, you you were into Cool and the Gang, like yeah, you said, but my, Stevie Wonder and all you, that. My my daddy played modern jazz. Okay, so my father was playing like songs in five four, and I, the music we didn't like was like New Orleans music. What the banjo and you know, kind of tourists and you yuck yucking and dancing. And my daddy didn't play that kind of music. He played like like uh, the music John Coltrane and them were playing, but he had very little audience for that style of music. So we, I always empathize with him because I was always at his gigs. But you never thought you could play his music because it was hard. Mm -hmm. And my father really could play. So when you were growing up playing, you could play you know, popular music, but you wasn't gonna play with him. <laughs> and you couldn't. And he also was not against you playing that music, so you couldn't push against him. I remember one time my father played, we played a dance 
at this at this uh, high school, McMain High School, and my father came to play uh, with our funk band. So you know, cats knew my daddy was a musician, but they didn't really know who he was. You know, nobody didn't really know. Plus, we didn't. Most of the people in the band, we didn't know what playing actually was. Most of what we listened to was you know the, f the funk music of that time, where people not really playing on the records. They pop records. And to play bebop or to play like musical ideas that go on and on and on. We had, were not exposed to it. I was because of my father, but the other cats in my band, uh, fantastic. we were like brothers, so we were very close. And I said, well, my daddy going to play. So he knew the members of the Crusaders because in the South at that time, guys my daddy's age, they all knew each other. There's only maybe 25 jazz musicians in the entire South trying to play modern jazz. And uh, the, the cats in the Crusaders, with, with Joe Sample and everybody, my father knew them. So we played a song called uh, Keep That Same Old Feeling, but it has a bridge. And I know my father didn't know the song. So they're like a, a kind of difficult pro progression. And funk songs never really have bridges like that. So when my father came up to play, he said, let him play on this song. So the other trumpet player was my partner named Lebo. John Roche was his name. He said, man, you can't, you can't have your daddy play on that song, man. What are you going to do when you get to all these changes? So I said, man, my daddy can play, man. He's going he gonna to listen to that one time. He's going to be able to play it. He was like, man, no way in the world. So, you know, we playing a dance, man. So my daddy got to the tune he played. Then, okay, after the second time, he could play the bridge. Then he played like real, like bebop, like in the tradition of Bob Powell and, and McCoy Tyner. And he, I mean, that's that's how he could play. So he started playing the trumpet player, looked at me, he was in shock. He said, man, what is that your daddy playing, man? <laughs> I never heard nothing like that. So nobody knew what playing was. And then he got on the microphone and said, this Ellis Marcellus, y'all. He's announcing to the crowd. You know, people, <laughs> people in the dance, they don't care about no. nobody playing. Right. And uh, it was, uh, to give you a sense of like just the kind of the vibe, and you know, for us with our daddy, he was cool with it. I mean, he, he was happy to, happy to play. He played Fender Rose. He was, he was like, yeah, man, you know, that's nice. But he wasn't trying to play what we were playing. He was right. trying to play. Right. And uh, it was a sacrifice that came with playing. And he and he he paid that he, he sacrificed. It was a decision. It was his decision. A conscious decision. And made. and he played. So right. you know that's what he decided to do. Right. I love your speech to Kenyon College. I watched it the other day. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. It's great. You look like you're having fun doing a commencement <laughs> speech. What are you? Yeah, yeah. I've had fun talking to young people. Yeah. And you know, cause the cause the alumni have been asking me to I, some of the, the the guys who asked me to do it for years. I have known for 30 years. So Murray Harwood started telling me about Kenyon College in 1965. We were doing a show <laughs> about Snoopy in Berlin to teach kids jazz. And then and then with uh, Mark Rosenthal, who's been on Jazz Lincoln Center board for 20 years, 20 something years, always, man, come to Kenyon, come to Kenyon. So you finally Barry showed Schwartz, up. Barry Schwartz, come to Kenyon. Yeah, so finally I said, okay, I'm coming to Kenyon. And, uh, but you look like you were having, you really enjoying the moment. I, I did because I, I enjoyed the people I met. You know, one one of the Ruth, the, the other lady who was awarded, was a, a, a scholar on Genghis Khan and on Asian. So I was talking with her, and I, I you know, I, I read books on Genghis Khan. I like Genghis Khan, and she was telling me stuff really counter to what I knew. So I was like, well, I, you know, listening to what you saying, I said, well, I don't know. So I was talking to one of the other teachers. I said, yeah, I was talking to Ruth, and she was saying this and that, and then I was kind of like, I don't know. He said, well, you know, she speaks Finnish, Chinese, Japanese, Tangut. He went through like eight languages. He said, well, she speaks these seven or eight languages. Do you speak any of them? I said, I said, no. He said, I'm just trying to let you know who you were talking to. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I enjoyed the whole experience. And I always enjoy seeing the families and the kids mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah. There's a great line you have in there. You say, live life, you tell these young people, live life as if it's the fourth quarter. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, I told them about how time is. Yes. And, and I was trying to put in the perspective about, about old folks and time. Because if you're playing a game that has a clock, you ain't looking at the clock in the first quarter. No. But boy, when you get to that fourth quarter, that clock is all you can see. And uh, you know, you, I was telling you, you can't, you, your life is not a menu of experiences that you pick and choose from what you want. You don't know what's gonna happen. And all stuff happens that you, a lot of stuff happens you don't want to happen. And you got to be present. Like you can't be on your phone when it's happening. And we have a problem with kind of transferred experience. You know, get on the, see? There you go. Yeah, it is right, right there. That's what they're saying. It's emergency. The phone got mad. Just stop calling. <laughs> the, phone got, the phone got mad. I told you not to call me here. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Right. No, but, the, but you, had, you had a great line there. You said, we need you, graduates, to do all the things Alexa cannot. <laughs> right. Right? The technology is taking over our lives, especially yeah. young people. 
But it's like the Tower of Babel, just for today. The Tower of Babel always a myth that I loved in the Bible. People built something that they thought was more important than being people. And that's, I think that's just a cycle that humanity has, has gone through this many times. We know the last, I don't know, four or 5,000 years of history, but maybe history, <laughs> man, it may have been civilizations 50,000. We don't really actually know. You know, the science does not actually tell us. Right. So they, they want you bad. Killing me, man. That's my road. son, okay? That's my kid. There you go, that's Speaking why. Speaking of Father's Day. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you sat, when you stood there and looked out at, the, at those young people, did you, what, what did you, what was the sensation? Do you feel like I've reached a certain point and I need to, I need to share it? You know? No, I mean, I've, I've, ta- I've given a lot of commencement speeches. Right. I've talked to kids a lot right. in schools all over the, the country of all kinds. You, know, you remember in the, in the 80s, I went to over over a thousand schools. I mean, I, that's what I did. 80s and 90s, I worked. I've been. I, I have a lot of experience. Sure, and, but and the, the, for some reason, I've seen you do a bunch of these. This one looked a little different to me. I'm not sure why. No, felt the same. Man, I, I don't. I don't know. I always try to be be for real with uh with kids and their parents. I'm always honored to be there, and I, sometimes I have to fight down getting full. Sometimes, just I think when you get older, you just oh, you're older, you know. Fourth quarter. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I'm in the fourth quarter yet. <laughs> <laughs> Half time. But you know, you know what I mean? You don't, yeah, yeah, you start to, I, I think, uh, but I, I don't, I never really know how, what I'm, I don't, I can't analyze myself, you know, and I don't, I don't even try to do it. I, it's like when you're playing, you cannot analyze what you're playing. I once asked Jerry Mulligan and on an NPR show how to, about great solos. So the question was, how do you play a great solo? He said, well, I don't know how, if I could tell you how to play a great solo, but I can tell you how to not play a great solo. <laughs> Stand up and say, I'm getting ready to play a great solo. Right. And I, I, I always laugh. I think I was 20 years, that was 1996, so that was 23 right. years ago. But I, I always think about, you can't, you can't observe your life while you live it. You, you're living, so. Right. But you do wonder how what you're saying is being received. You know, yeah, that's that's only natural. But I learned the first time I went to Japan, you never know how what you're saying is being received because the Japanese audience is absolutely quiet. <laughs> Man, I was like, boy, these people really don't like this music. <laughs> that was 1981. Wow. So I was 19, and I thought, man, we just we are we are bombing here. They were just. <laughs> just and you're dying out there. And I felt it, but then after it was like, yeah, you know. So I don't. I never presume to to know what any person thinks about right. about anything, right? Because nobody knows what I'm thinking about stuff. <laughs> and that was another one of my daddy's big. Here things. we go. <laughs> you know, that was my daddy was always man. You don't know what nobody's thinking, man. They may be thinking I'm hungry. <laughs> you know, jumping at conclusions yeah, like that. Yeah, you because right. and a lot of times you notice you have conversations. Somebody say, "I bet they were." I think they think, and I bet you they were. Man, you don't know what you they have think. No idea. You have no idea. I so, get that all the time, by the way. Really? Yeah, they read reading my face. They, think, they, think they, they know, know what you think. They have no idea. <laughs> yeah. And I'm literally, like you said, thinking I'm hungry. <laughs> right. Right. You're thinking, man, I, I, do I have the right shoes on? I got to call my wife back. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and they have no idea. Right. What? What's? There's so many life lessons, right? Well, what's the one you most recently thought about that, you know, was an aha moment or you just were thankful for that made you full? You know, I think the thing I've been thinking about the most is a, uh, is the, the need to create space, through humility. And through listening. The need to create space, like when you listen, you create space. And even if 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 you are if you are humble, you create space. So that's the thing I've been thinking about. How is do it, you create more space? Is that hard to do? Yeah. It's hard to create space. It's Physically? Mentally? It's hard in every way. That's why yoga is hard. That's why the deepest punishment in our culture is solitary confinement. <laughs> it's hard to just sit. Do you have any answers on that one? No. That's that's a profound question. That's my answer. That's a little too profound. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Me. That's, my, that's my answer. No, I don't. <laughs> that's what my little brother, we call him the oracle because he knows everything. He says the... The more I re- the more I realize this study, 
I realize I don't know anything. <laughs> That's my that? mantra. I, I do not. One answer I can be sure of: I do not know. Yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> but you find that musically, that the need to create space is in incredibly important. Yeah, with your listening, and you know when you like the like the album we did of Buddy Bolden, music. When you play New Orleans music, other people are playing the whole time. So the music is cacophonous. It's a lot of the clarinet plays with the trumpet, and the trombone plays with the with the trumpet. Three people are playing melody lines together. You have to create even more space, even though y'all are all playing together. And you have to be able to hear them. So you can play and still hear them. Space doesn't mean you're absolutely quiet. It means you're listening and responding appropriately to the space that they're uh, playing in. And when you try to apply that to life? You know, it's, it's, life is it's, it's much more difficult because there are many dynamics that were set in play before you came on the scene. You're born midstream. My great uncle had a funny saying, he said, you didn't mess this up, you're not gonna fix it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and when you're playing, you, you the, the life of the song is the duration of that experience. And it requires discipline, but it does not require the same discipline that life requires. In, in life, you're always in a circle, so you have a lot below you and a lot above you. You have a lot to the left, to the right, and all around you. And you can only perceive what you can. Most of it, you cannot. You can't perceive it. Right. So even if you're trying, you, you're going to be ignorant to most of what's going on. I was looking to end on a hopeful note here. <laughs> That's good. Acknowledging your ignorance is hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> well, like my, I used that thing in the Kenyan college. The thing that my daddy would do in the class, he'd make four people stand back to back. Right. In a room. Right. And he would say, describe what you see. And then he'd tell other person, describe what you see. You just so of course, you're describing different things. Four you're people. at this, you're describing that. You're describing the, water, the windows you see. You're describing the clock. You're describing the blackboard. You're describing a piano or the bass. And he would say, now, does the fact that y'all all see different things mean that we're not in the same room? And we said, we're in the same room. So does the fact that you don't see what he's seeing mean that he's wrong and you're right? Now think of all of what the, the, the four of y'all, with your perspective, think of all in this room you still can't see. And that's how I want you to come to learn in this stuff that I'm teaching y'all. You don't know. And be open to many possibilities. Right. And there could be many possibilities, including the opposite to the one you believe, and y'all could both be true. No. Yes. No, I'd be right. You see that? There see? you go. That's why he taught I'd you that. I'd be right. That's why. He, that's why he taught you that. <laughs> You're looking at the clock, but that's a window on the other side. It's <laughs> a good place right there. Yeah, you're Thank right, you, man. Bro. Man, always a pleasure. You know, I love you. Back at I you. I love man. seeing you, man. It's it's a pleasure to talk with you, and thank you. It's a, it's a privilege to be with oh, you, man. Man, Seriously. my my privilege. Seriously. I'm, I'm not playing. We're not doing the thing like that. No, no, no. Really, no. it's just a genuine yeah, man. love and respect I have for you. Thank you. Back at you, man. Yes, sir. Thank you. Most I wish we could work a place where we could play this play some more. Play, play us out. That's the first time I ever got that one right. <laughs> That's fun to bend them nose though. That's a lot of fun, man. It's 
Great stuff, that's man. That's fun in all the music. You get fun doing that. Great stuff. You must have had a ball. <laughs>